On January 1st, 1760, King Frederick the Great of Prussia sent a letter to his brother, Henry. After years of bloody warfare and constant setbacks, the letter provides a candid look at his kingdom's hopeless situation. Our situation is abominable. My heart is eaten away by sorrow. And what depresses me most of all is the knowledge that I have come to the end of my resources. We have nothing left. I do not wish to plunge you into gloom on this New Year's Day, but I have to speak frankly, and this terrible prospect is evident to all who do not shut their eyes to it. The disastrous Battle of Maxen, ending the 1759 campaign, severely weakened the Prussian position. It revived Austrian, Russian, and French motivation to deal with the kingdom once and for all. Prussia's position was not lost on its adversaries. Count Kaunitz, the foremost proponent of war at the Austrian court, wrote to the Russians, The king of Prussia is as good as destroyed. The English financial strength is exhausted. Frederick's bouts with his health had been rather prevalent ever since the onset of the 1758 campaign. Now, after a total of four years of war, with tens of thousands of dead, stress, losses, setbacks, reverses and twists, his health wasn't getting any better. By the winter of 59, it appeared Frederick's morale was at an all-time low. He did not see any prospect of establishing peace, and if he lost one more battle, he felt it would collapse his entire kingdom. Two years of continuous, severe defeats took its toll, and the 1759 campaign had been exceptionally bloody and disastrous. Moreover, his finances, something he took pride in always having in order, were in an abysmal state. He debased the currency and inflation spurred, helping his short-term budgetary problem. The Austrians had scored an alarming number of victories. The Russians would undoubtedly return, and even Ferdinand on the Western Front had a difficult time against the French and their new energetic commander, the Duc de Broglie. The impact of these wars goes far beyond reshaping borders. It can set the stage for the world to come, and as with all history, it's key to realize how these events affect us. We can see today with the global turmoil our world is embroiled in, these past few years have drastically hamstrung the global economy. Shortages in commodities, oil and gas will see 75 million people and countless businesses facing losing power, an economic hardship felt as far as the US. In fact, A stunning survey revealed that over half of Americans making six figures already live paycheck to paycheck. It's clear that a financial storm is brewing and nobody is safe. No wonder CEOs and fund managers are pouring hundreds of millions into low correlation assets, because even if markets flatline this year, these assets can continue to climb. Assets like the contemporary art on offer at Masterworks whose prices have more than doubled the S&P 500's return for the last 26 years. Now, Masterworks lets you invest in multi-million dollar paintings without breaking the bank, and they've built a track record of 11 exits, all of them profitable. No wonder Masterworks has seen over 650,000 investors try to gain access, and there's even a wait list. But Masterworks reached out to me to give those interested VIP access to their latest offerings. Just check the description below. A personal note written during this time reads, I do not know whether I shall survive this war, but I am firmly resolved, in case this happens, to spend the rest of my days in seclusion, in the bosom of philosophy and friendship. The victory against the French at Minden was among the brightest points of the year. And additionally, the British victories against the French in Canada. But their defeat meant the French had to look for a new area to secure a good position when peace negotiations inevitably started. Prussia became their prime target. Frederick embarked on an ambitious diplomatic winter campaign to establish peace with whichever adversary would listen. Informants at Versailles assured him Louis XV desperately wanted peace. But the only way to achieve it was through negotiations between France and Britain. 
and Britain made it explicitly clear they would not start negotiations if Frederick had to give up Silesia, a deal-breaker for Austria. He also tried to seduce the Ottoman Empire to join a war against Austria. He sent lavish gifts to the Sultan and Grand Vizier. These did not result in anything. But the actions underscored the dire situation Prussia found itself in. His strategy regarding the war was the same as the previous years, although he seemingly had to do much more with much less. He wanted to maintain control over Saxony and Silesia. The Austrians still held control of Saxony's capital, Dresden. Frederick planned to recapture it. Historians conflict about how many troops were at Prussia's disposal. At the onset of the 59 campaign, Frederick commanded 160,000. It is necessary to highlight that quantity did not mean quality. Many of his troops were freshly levied recruits, freebooters, and rogues. At the onset of the 1760 campaign, the most generous estimate was that the Prussian army numbered 110,000. And the quality was undoubtedly even worse than the year before. At the Battle of Maxen, 15,000 veterans, nine generals and 500 officers were captured. Not to mention all those who were lost at the Battle of Kunersdorf. The shortages led to Frederick enlisting Austrian and Saxon prisoners. And very young cadets. Correspondence with his minister survives in which Frederick laments he longed for the day when he would not send children into battle. He scraped the bottom of the barrel. By April 1760, the spring campaign came to life. Frederick and 55,000 troops stood ready at Meissen. Henry, commanding 35,000, stood at Sagan to keep an eye on the Russians. Lieutenant General Henri Auguste de la Motte Fouque protected Landschut with 12,000. He secured an important road junction to provide easy access to Silesia. Blood had been shed three years before as the Austrians and Prussians clashed at the same stronghold. It is safe to assume Prussia's enemies outnumbered them well over two to one. The Russians loomed behind the Polish border. The Duchy of Prussia had been under Russian occupation for so long that some reports hinted at the Duchy becoming Russian one day, a disaster. By spring, the Allies were converging against the Prussian positions. Loudon, commanding 40,000 soldiers camped in Upper Silesia. Dawn, commanding at least 80,000, camped at Dresden. General Lacey camped to the city's north. Rumors of an imperial army marching to reinforce Dawn reached Frederick. He figured there was no time to waste. For weeks, Frederick maneuvered, attempting to seduce Lacey to battle, to no avail. His main army could not leave Saxony, while Loudon's army clearly wanted to capture Breslau. The Austrians definitely held the upper hand. A stalemate developed around Dresden. News reached Frederick that a Russian army numbering around 20,000 crossed the Vistula and again marched against his capital. Time was running out. He prolifically wrote Henry, who often chose to ignore his messages. Frederick wanted him to engage in battle, whereas Henry preferred cautious campaigning, destroying supply depots. It would be the Austrians who launched the first serious combat in this campaign. General Loudon considered his superior, Dorn, too slow and too cautious. Loudon's goal was to confuse the king rather than be patient and strike so violently that Frederick would have no other option but to respond. With success, letters survive where Frederick refers to Loudon's movements as incomprehensible. All Prussian commanders understood the danger of Loudon in Upper Silesia. They were heavily outnumbered, barely able to garrison the strongholds of Breslau, Schweidnitz and Neisse. At Landschut, Fouque felt a battle was imminent, and he wrote to the king he was stationed there without much of an army. His direct orders were to hold Landschut to the last man. On June 23rd, General Loudon put his military doctrine about violent attacks into practice and attacked General de la Motte Fouque at Landeschut. Despite his army numbering 11,500 soldiers at best, Fouquet's position was relatively secure. He commanded 9,500 infantry, nearly 2,000 cavalry and 69 guns. 
Landshut was a strategic stronghold for a reason. The Prussian army was positioned on most elevations around it, holding the strategic high ground. If need be, there were several passes across the Boba River they could use to escape, but Loudon was resolved to overwhelming the Prussian positions. He deployed his army, numbering up to 30,000 in several columns. Two columns of infantry were tasked to charge against the northeast and east rises through Vogelsdorf. Once these engaged in combat, another part of his army would charge against the Mummelberg and Buchberg. To the south, some irregular contingents stood at the ready to divert Fuchs' attention. All the way to the south, a column was to attack the Prussian far right at Reichenersdorf. Loudon ordered his cavalry to hold back and reinforce parts of the line which would need it during combat. Just before 2 a.m. on the morning of June 23rd, the Austrian columns moved into action. Thick woods, fog and darkness hid their movements. The road to Vogelsdorf was uneventful, and soon the first Austrian columns engaged in combat against the Prussians at its outskirts. Surprised and unprepared, these were driven away. The Austrians launched a fierce follow-up charge against the second Prussian line to the west. These were annihilated. Within an hour, Vogelsdorf was seized. It gave the Austrians an ideal strategic position to launch their main assault. With the Buchberg exposed, the Prussian left flank was in full retreat. Meanwhile, the other northern column advanced relatively rapidly. Any scattered Prussian contingents were easily beaten back. The Austrian vanguard reached the lines of Landeschut, where Fouquet decided to make a stand and fight tooth and nail. Fighting around Landeschut continued for several hours. To the south, the advance was much more difficult. The first two Austrian attacks were beaten back by the Prussians around the Blastorferberg. After several charges, the Prussians were briefly beaten back, but reinforcements allowed them to counterattack and recapture their original positions. But to their rear, the enemy made inroads against Landeschut. Before too long, the Austrians scaled the barricades and the Prussians were driven from the stronghold. Fouquet's escape route was blocked and he collected his scattered troops in a clearing. Fouquet acted with commendable initiative. He ordered his remaining infantry to form a square and withdraw towards crossings in the Boba, despite being cut off. His remaining cavalry advanced and had to clear the passes. As they prepared their retreat, freshly arrived howitzers opened fire. Under heavy artillery fire, the outnumbered Prussian infantry fought off several charges against them, often at bayonet distance. The Prussians on the southern hills held out stubbornly as well. Loudon ordered his artillery to focus on them, but the outnumbered Prussians held out. It was not until an infantry corps crossed the Boba River and flung themselves into their flank and rear that all Prussians on the Blasdorfberg were killed or captured. Meanwhile, to the north, the Prussians were in a very dire situation. Combat had been ongoing for hours, and the infantry square tried to hold the line under incredibly punishing conditions. Fouquet did his best to rally his men. Unbeknownst to him, the cavalry had successfully cleared the crosses. Then, across the Boba, they ran into Austrian infantry and dragoons who approached from the far south. Despite being outnumbered, the Prussian cavalry commander charged at them resolutely. Some of his cavalry broke through, but many were beaten and taken prisoner after bitter hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Nearby the village, the Austrian artillery continued mauling Fouquet's men, who entrenched themselves as well as they could. They were heavily outnumbered, as the Austrian infantry reinforced the front lines. To their south, Austrian infantry emerged along the defences between the Boba and Galgenberg. The Prussians were threatened on both flanks and their front. They could do nothing but retreat. A battered, scarcely operable force tried to reach the clearings. Loudon ordered Fouquet to surrender several times, but he refused these summons. His infantry beat back repeated charges against their positions as they made their way across the river. Across the river, a horrible surprise awaited them. Their cavalry was nowhere to be seen. 
Instead, the Austrians controlled all crossings and surrounded the clearing and small village the Prussian army emerged at. They could expect no quarter. They knew an attack was imminent. The Prussian forces valiantly held their ground against the initial surge of enemy cavalry. But as their ammunition dwindled, the Austrian infantry stormed the battlefield. Cracks emerged among the entire Prussian army. The clash was a tempest of steel as Fouquet was struck down from his steed by a hail of bullets, wounded thrice. A fierce struggle erupted around the fallen general. In a display of chivalry and valor, Prussian General Voy offered his own parade horse to the badly wounded Fouquet. Fouquet, with unwavering spirit, refused, stating, I would not soil this magnificent steed with my blood. Voit replied with reverence, The sheen of this steed would only be enhanced by being stained with the blood of a hero. As artillery mauled their positions, Austrian cavalry charged against the Prussians from every side. Finally, the Prussian army was overwhelmed and its soldiers either surrendered or were killed. It was a massacre and another unmitigated disaster. By the end of the day, Prussia lost almost 2,000 soldiers on the battlefield. Another 8,315 were captured, including Fouquet himself. They lost 67 artillery pieces, 34 colors, and two standards. Less than 1,000 survivors escaped to Breslau. Fouquet himself suffered three saber cuts. The Austrians lost a bit under 3,000 men. He furnished an example of what courage and strength of will can do against superior numbers. His action that day can be compared to that of Leonidas at Thermopylae. The disaster at Landeshut was similar to the previous one at Maxim. Again, a Prussian general obeyed the king's orders against better judgment. And again, the unwavering loyalty backfired. In contrast to Frederick's irrational anger after Maxon, he openly second-guessed himself and his decision to hold the town. He certainly was milder in judging Fouquet. In the battle's aftermath, Loudon pillaged Landshut. The strong Austrian position in the province was a breaking point for Frederick. He decided he valued Silesia more than anything. One week after the battle, he collected his army and marched to the east, knowing the dangers of his risky mission very well. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please leave a like, it really helps out the channel. If there is a topic, battle or person you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 per month, you will already gain early access to all my videos without any in-video advertisements. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.